Here we go, summer edition of the Mad Good Knicks Show. I'm far. Summer league is in the books. RJ Barrett had a slow start, but picked things up. Iggy impressed, and our second year guys made some very positive strides. This episode will examine our newly minted young core and look at how well they could actually mesh with our gritty group of veterans the Knicks have racked up. What's the starting lineup look like? How many wins can the superstarless squad actually rack up? Dare we say, playoffs? Playoffs? If you're new here, on the left side of your screen is our rundown. And on the bottom right, that's a subscribe button. Go ahead and hit it like Bobby Portis hit Meritage. But also, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and share the crap out of this video. If you want more Mad Good content, check us out on Instagram, where we post stuff daily. Now sit back, relax, so we Mad Good, baby. What's up, man? It's Damian Dawson from the Knicks. You're watching the Mad Good Knicks Show. Welcome to the Mad Good Smelling Show. Y'all smell delicious. Woo! I smell fierce. Mad Good Knicks Show Summer Edition. Your boy Far J T K Pete Steph Petey the crew is back. Uh, you don't know this bro, is no Bro, I, I was just about to say. Does, I think we I upgraded. cut my hair. We upgraded, and yet we still on top of each other. Pause. <laughs> we upgraded. Hey. upgraded. Uh, That's the uh, only thing new on set, guys. Uh, uh, Look around. We got a lot to discuss, though. Summer league ended. Knicks are in full full off season mode right now. Julius Randle got an invite to the Olympics. Ooh. A lot of stuff is happening. Yeah, yeah. Jamie Dotson's out here doing kickball. I love it. I love it. We spoke to Nate Robinson. <laughs> yeah, he has high hopes for the Knicks too. That's right. A lot of good stuff happening, guys. First and foremost, everyone having a good summer? Love it. Staying Absolutely. dry, staying cool. Yeah, everything nice Gucci, baby. Everything Gucci. Gucci. I don't know Yo, yes or no, and we'll discuss this more later, but will yes. the Knicks make the playoffs? I said yes. No. Before even the question. No. You know what? Sorry, I, I said one word. My <laughs> answer no. is yes. Sneak in. I'm going to say no. Sneaky. But I love the Knicks. Sneaky. Sneaky. I love you guys. So... If you're a first time watcher of the show, hit that subscribe button like right over there. Right there. And right there over there. Sure. Please go over there. Hit us on Instagram. We're there almost every single day. And like, uh, like, enjoy like, the like. show. Ace, get that popcorn ready. What's going on, y'all? Welcome to the Maggot Day Show. This feels Segment good. Segment one. This right. feels good, right? Feels, feels a little good. breezy in here, a little spacey. We like, we like what we see. I hope you guys do too. We upped first, our game. We upped our game just a little bit, man. So <laughs> no, first, no, I meant the Knicks do. First and foremost, that too, and we got a lot to discuss on we that do. front. So uh, welcome, please like, follow, subscribe, hit the comment section, let us know your guys' thoughts. And if you're watching us for the first time, do hit that subscribe button, look at us on Instagram, because we got content bing, bing. pumping on the daily. All right, so the state of the New York Knicks. Woo! Summer League is over. This is our special mid midsummer episode. Um, Guys, I'll Enough. start off by, I mean, man of, of really the summer, and that's R.J. Barrett. He's supposed to be the answer. Steph, I'll start with you. R.J. Barrett, thoughts? R.J. Wait, Barrett, I'm sorry, really quick. Thoughts. Before you jump into the before thoughts. Before I jump into my thoughts. I know they've been waiting for this episode. Yeah. I know our fans have been waiting for this content. Yes. I'm so glad to be here with you guys, as usual, so we can drop this content. Go ahead. Baby. I love it. Okay. Let me first off start off by saying... How the New York Knicks fans took R.J. Barrett from a summer league perspective. At first, we were very disappointed. Not we, in general, Knicks fans were. A few games down the line, four or five games later, the audience totally swayed in the opposite direction, saw his capabilities, saw his almost triple-double game. Overall, my perspective on R.J. Barrett is this kid has potential, his per 36 is insane, and the fact that he improved from the beginning to the end of summer league, which is a very short stint, shows me his future and potential in the league. Well said. Uh, before you go, let me just read the stats. 15.4 points per game, 4.2 assists, and then 8.6 rebounds. Nothing, not to mention, nothing to scoff at. Not to mention, sure. he's the first player in summer league history to average over 15 points, over 8 rebounds, and over 4 assists. How do you like them apples? Six that's, that's nice. Those are um, New York apples. Six six so, so Steph made the point. I yeah. think all of us kind of agree with that, but I'll ask you. So... The, the first two games, is that something to be concerned about? It, it's it's hilarious because I feel like Nick fans are so fair weather sometimes. We love you guys. Of course, we are fans as well. Yeah. But we are so easily manipulated. You know, we follow what everyone says too often. 
So for example, when you should be following what the MAGA Nick shows it. So. Follow what we say. <laughs> that, that's all that matters, right, guys? Great so idea. for example, we hear all this hype surrounding R.J. Barrett, which is is welcomed. You know, it, it, he's he's well deserved. Yeah. But he struggled his first two games. And instantly, you know, Nick fans were so reserved, they were coming back with, well, you know, Derrick Rose had a bad summer league and a Trey Young had a bad summer league. So we were trying to find excuses to why he didn't perform the way he should have. When in all reality, he hadn't played a, a game in three months. I mean, come on guys, cut him some slack. He, you know, things take time to develop and he got his feet wet. The first two games he struggled, his field goal percentage was low, but ultimately he came out uh, on top. And like I said, you know, he was the first player in summer league history to have over 15 points averaging over eight rebounds and over four assists. Not only that though, guys, what I saw from RJ Barrett that I liked the most was him as a distributor. Him as a distributor, you know, a, a point forward kind. Yeah. Um, I know he plays the two a lot, but having the ball in his hands, I felt very secure about that. And um, the thing I liked about it the most was when he was double teamed or when he got into trouble, he always kept his head up and his dribble alive. There was times where I saw Mitchell Robinson cutting to the basket and our boy Iggy, who we're going to discuss later, cut to the basket and I saw a nice dump off pass. So I was pleasantly thrilled, um, not just surprised because I don't want to say surprised because I think we all knew how well RJ was going to do isn't once he, he started to catch up. But Isn't it funny how exactly what you're saying, we saw a, a line from him being very timid and tentative as a player, not playing like his usual yeah. self, and the time he had that major growth spurt, which seemed to be overnight, yep. into kind of like a almost a triple double type of guy so i think it's that timidness and he was just kind of a little scared and you can tell when he was driving to the basket he was Hesitant. looking around yep. he wasn't his usual self i and agree I think man. he figured himself out so quickly now i'm wondering was that even timidness or was that uh rj barrett just reading the game because he is that a little bit of both it could be that. rust timid you know, you be the game. Too, yeah. summer league. When we Especially go, against his boy, game man, one. the studio's making you guys excited. I've never been interrupted <laughs> this much <laughs> on the magazine. Wait, you are one. again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm blanking out. <laughs> I'm trying to get one point and can't do it. Um, so, RJ Barrett, we saw what he did again in the summer league. Started off slow. Can, is that going to carry over to the regular season, guys? Absolutely. I think it's only a matter of time. I think, you know, with somebody like Kevin Knox last year, we saw he started off slow and it was due to injury. And then he kind of picked up the pace. Mm -hmm. I think RJ is, is going to pick up the pace a lot quicker. Um, God willing, he stays injury free. But um, I think he's going to adapt to the NBA game just like that. Yep, right. Uh, I have very high hopes for RJ, but let's keep in mind, again, the NBA Summer League is not the NBA. It's not a great reflection. A lot of these players won't even play in the NBA, but I still have high hopes that he'll at least be a 15 plus point per game player. Uh, I think uh, just looking at his turnovers too, mm. that was a story in and of itself. Yeah, no, he, it was. He had like six, eight turnovers the first couple games, mm -hmm. and then he lowered it down to two max the whole yeah. way through, and then he ended up averaging just 2.8 turnovers through five games. The fact that you play five games and you have eight turnovers in one game, yeah. yeah. And that's your average? That's very impressive. He was averaging impressive. more turnovers than field goals in the beginning. At right? one point, yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Yeah. Fans were panicking. I know. Really quick, I just Last want to touch on, on one more point, right? This is something that I mentioned previously when it was Steph, Pete, and I on the set and we were making our player comparisons. I compared R.J. Barrett to a one D. Wade. And the reason why I compared him to D. Wade was for his rebounding. I am going big time. Uh -oh. I have him KD, as a taller version of none other than D. Wade. And how well of a rebounding guard D. Wade was when he was in his prime. I see R.J. Barrett, as, as we know, Summer League, granted, isn't NBA caliber, but he did average 8.6 rebounds per game. And uh, I think that'll carry over and translate. You can't fake rebounds, so Not yeah, enough. I agree with you. There. Let's talk about Iggy, uh, our second round pick, man. He uh, he had himself a 30-point game at one point. Uh, collectively, averaged 15.4 points, two assists, and 5.2 rebounds. The most, the part that impressed me the most, he had damn near 50% field goal percentage, yep. 48.2, yep. and then 44.7 from three-point line. The kid's energy. I mean, I think we all called it. He was going to be an instant fan favorite, but we see the skill set that he brings to the game and how he was clearly a cut above a lot of his other fellow peers. And now you really wonder, how the hell did this kid fall to the second round? Oh, dude, yeah. You know what's, what's perfect about this? The Knicks originally had the 55th selection, right? Yeah. And it, it got to 46th pick, and they saw Iggy was still there. So they traded up for him at 47. 
Uh, you know, the Knicks knew what they were doing. Our scouting department has been spot on the past the two years. Round, yeah, yeah. In the second round, yeah. for sure. For sure. <laughs> we're so not going to yeah. go go there. But First as far round, as Iggy TBD. goes, <laughs> TBD. As far as Iggy goes, there was just one play I think we all remember uh, is a standout play. And this was during uh, the Phoenix game, uh, which majority of the team struggled. He ended the game with 30 points in overtime in a loss. But... He came down to court and hit that huge three yep. to send it to overtime. And I know this is just summer league, but the courage, the cahoots to, to take that shot. What's my stoop? You know, a game in crunch time. You could be in pickup ball. That's you big hit that time shot, move, that's still, bro. That's and, big, uh, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of his game. He's a slasher. He's a big forward. He gets to the basket. He's tough. And he can spot up and shoot. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of his game. Steph? One word. One word if I'm going to define my man Iggy. It's composure. Yeah. I got to be honest. Through and through, he surprised me from the beginning of Summer League to the end. A little more than RJ Barrett did from a mental standpoint. Because mm -hmm. the time he set his foot on the floor from the first game, his aggression, his no hesitation to take a three-point shot... His sight, like the way he looks with his body language, it seems like he's a pro, mm -hmm. like he's a player that's played this game and he's just moving on to the next level. There's, I got no sense from him that he was kind of backing down or taking it back or a little timid at all. So the fact that he had his mental on, his head was on his shoulders really strongly at the summer league, only gives me high hopes when it comes to this season. Now let me ask you, do you think it was due to lack of expectations for a second rounder as opposed to why RJ struggled and Iggy didn't? Or do you think he could just go out and play freely because I think hey, Iggy's all Iggy. eyes like, No matter RJ. what situation you put him in, I think he's going to play the Love exact it. same way. Yeah. Kind of like Alonzo Trier. Like, yeah. I feel like whatever team you put Trier in, whatever situation, yeah. he's just, that's 100%. how he knows how to play. And also, I also do think that that did have an effect. The mm -hmm. fact that he might be the underdog, that might have motivated him. The fact that he was second round, low expectations. He questioned it. Questioned it, but he's got the mental on, man, which is can, what we Can need. we just get a quick flex from a man, Iggy, bro? I think he's going to be a huge <laughs> fan favorite. Uh, at the Garden. I think we're going to love seeing him oh, flex. Yeah, instantly, man. He's the um, dude at the park that you hate to play against, but to love to have him on Oh, absolutely. Team, He's that type of um, guy. Let's quickly talk about Knox, Mitchell, and Trier, our yeah. sophomores. It was fun seeing them in the role that they were in, um, just as like the quote-unquote veterans, that, and Knox is still a freaking teenager, right. uh, but <laughs> quote-unquote veterans on this team. Um, what, really quickly, we could just go around the horn, but what do you guys expect from, from our three, three returning guys? Do you want to hit this one up first? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm expecting a lot from them. Uh, but it's funny because they have a lot less pressure and a lot less responsibility. Mm -hmm. Last year, coming into it, Knox was, was instantly like, we expect this guy to score. We expect him to put up numbers. There was no KP. We didn't have any anybody else to look to. This year, we added Julius Randle. We added a Bobby Portis. We added a Wayne Morris, Ellington, yep. Peyton, Morris. All those guys averaged above double digits in scoring. So Kevin Knox's load is going to be a little less, which I expect him to thrive in. Alonzo Trier is going to have to do less, which I expect him to thrive in. Mitch is going to be Mitch. Defensively, he's going to be insane. But one thing about Knox that really impressed me in Summer League, he shot 40% from Field three. Goal Something that we man. saw, he was knocking them threes down. He called Something it. He worked and, out. and look, yep. I know that first Summer League game, that highlight reel of, of Knox getting basically, Oh, that was you know, nothing. That was nothing. Sun it's by Zion. Zion would have done gonna, that to everybody in the league. It's going to happen. But what was <laughs> yeah. impressive was if you look at every play outside of that, he contested Zion Williamson. Yep. So that, that shows me that he's actually focused on his defensive game. His field goal percentage of the first couple games of the summer league was impressive. Yeah. And it was unlike anything we had seen before. Mm -hmm. So, again, what, what impressed me most about Knox in particular, he said what he was going to do. Then he did went it. out and did yep. it. Yep. And that's impressive. And he got with, a little stronger. With Trier, he did. Oh, yeah. With Alonzo with Trier, I'm expecting kind of more of the same because he's going to play the yep. same role. I don't necessarily think that he's going to play le or do less <laughs> or okay. anything like that's that. Fair. I think I sincerely do believe he, he's actually going to take a step up, maybe hit that 14, 15 point mm, per wow. game average mm. coming off I the bench. Because that, be that nice. kid can score. Right. And he'll be a waste if he if Fizz doesn't play in the right minutes. Mitchell, I mean, I feel like a lot of our offense will will revolve around that guy's offensive rebound. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's and, hope and, so, and right? More <laughs> the same from the blocks. Yeah, yeah. I, I fully agree with everything you guys are saying. I saw Knox got bigger. He's got toned up, more aggressive when he's going to the basket. But his catch and shoot game is off the charts. I'm loving it. One thing I would love for him to, to continue to ba -da, work ba -da, on, ba -da. maybe. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. 
one more thing one thing that I'm actually um, looking forward to him actually fixing or improving in this game and I think will make a big difference is his ability to shoot off the dribble yep. his catch and shoot game is off the charts so Maybe I elite. think that he can build off that with another dribble move so it's not something that's unattainable in terms of Mitch foul trouble that's yeah. the only role that he keeps getting into but hopefully he can he can surpass that and get over it other than that i've seen confidence in them which is i think very important for a young core i mm -hmm. think Fizdell wants to see that mitch is having fun out there and yep. not just having fun out there they're, they're smiling fun. yeah less expectations for them in the coming year so mm -hmm. i think that everyone's out here to have fun learn together and having more backbone pieces will help the young core kind of feel more confident going in the next season and you know having those less of an expectation will make them you know feel more comfortable on the court you touched on mitch really quickly i would like to see him expand his offensive game a little more mm -hmm. i didn't see anything outside of catch uh, lobs i uh, put backs couple i'm all dunks. right with that i think no, the main thing i need thing, to see a little no, more no i think the main thing for him is playing close to 70 games this season if I could get that out of Mitchell Robinson with what he's doing in terms of close to three blocks per game, 13 points, 12 rebounds, like that is, that's good for me for year two. But, but he's averaging 13 points with no offensive game. Of How course. crazy is yeah. that? I know. It's that's amazing. a thing of beauty to but me. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I think that he's still got that level of rawness, but I think the situation's yeah. perfect for him. Makes sense. Uh, we had the free agent outlook um, coming up. We we're going to talk about it a little bit in this segment, but we, we just got into some lot, a lot, a lot of talks here. So, Free agents coming right up right after this. We're going to highlight five marquee free agents, followed by talk about some of our new additions. So you want to stick around for that. In the meantime, in the comments section below, tell us what you think about RJ. Tell us what you think about Iggy. Tell us what you expect from Knox, Trier, and Mitchell. Tell that us what good, you think baby. about us. <laughs> Dude, <you> guys. <laughs> Later. five marquee free agents that the Knicks signed, you know, marquee for the Knicks. Um, so I'll start first up, Bobby Portis. So he's a power forward who split last season between the Bulls and the Wizards. He signed a two year, $31 million contract with the 2020 team option. So, you know, one of those one in one deals. His combined stats in Chicago and Washington came to 14.2 points per game, 8.1 rebounds and 1.4 assists on 44% shooting. He ended up playing 50 games last season, averaging 27.4 minutes per game. He was the 22nd overall pick in 2015, and he's still young at 24 years old. He really, he really did take a big stride in 2017, jumping his scoring from 6.8 points per game to above 14, and that's what he's been doing consistently for the last two years. So more importantly though, his three-point percentage has steadily increased uh, each of the last three seasons, and now he's shooting above 40% from beyond the arc after being traded uh, to the Wizards last season. So he's also infamous, um, as you guys know and heard in my monologue, uh, he did deck the shit out of Nikola Mirotic in the locker room, um, and that was right after practice, and they were teammates. So if that ain't New York ball, I mean, I don't know what is. Now for some accolades. He was, in the, he was a McDonald's uh, All-American. He was Mr. Basketball in Arkansas in 2013. He made the SEC All-Freshman team and was named the SEC Player of the Year in 2015. Uh, he's likely to be back up to Mitchell Robinson at the center position, but he may shift between center and power forward. His outside shooting should help us stretch the defense, and his attitude will either be a complete blessing for us or gasoline on the fire. Bobby Drafted 14th by the Rockets in 2011, Marcus Thomas Morris Sr. has played for the Suns, Pistons, and most recently the Celtics, where he had his best season on the team that was one win away from the finals. He even had a stint in the G League in 2012 when he played for the Vipers representing the Rio Grande Valley. But on July 16th of this year, Marcus Morris officially signed with the Knicks. Now, many of you may already be familiar with Marcus Morris's rather strange free agency saga this summer. He initially turned down $41 million for three years on the Clippers to sign a two-year deal with the Spurs worth $20 million. Five days after making that verbal agreement with San Antonio, he reneged and joined the Knicks. Now, the speculation around his odd free agency was that his agent, Rich Paul, who also happens to represent LeBron, convinced Marcus not to join the Clippers so as not to give LBJ too much competition in town. Marcus flat out denied the accusation and simply said he did what was best for him and his family. Now Marcus Morris has a lot of family and friends in Philly which is nearby so that is certainly feasible. The Spurs deal however died on the vine because at the time of the deal Marcus reported that he thought that was his only option. Renegotiating Reggie Bullock's contract freed up the money necessary for the Knicks to pick up Morris and when that opportunity presented itself 
Morris took it. Interestingly enough, Marcus Morris and Rich Paul have since parted ways. All that drama aside, the Knicks have actually picked up a very solid player that will most likely be playing a bit downstream of his natural position as power forward. This might mean that Kevin Knox will have to compete for playing time with the three, but that's okay with me. Marcus is a seasoned vet. He's tough, he's very vocal, and he could teach the young guys a lot about emotional leadership and expose them to the type of grit and alpha mentality you need to see success in the playoffs. Marcus' best season saw him averaging 14 a game, and in 2016 he averaged 18 in a short playoff run with Detroit. In fact, Marcus has averaged double-digit points for the last five seasons. Last season he had his best shooting year, averaging 45% from the field, 38 from three, and 84 from the free throw line. Not bad at all. He also had a career year in rebounds and blocks, showing us that you can teach an old dog new tricks. I love seeing players continue to improve years into their NBA careers. To me, that shows character and integrity. I expect Marcus to start for the Knicks at small forward, and he will immediately impact the team in many tangible and intangible ways. If the relationship does not work out for some reason, we have a stretch four on the team that can shoot, and that certainly is a very viable asset to have in the modern NBA if you're looking to make moves. But I don't want to think about that right now. I want to think about how the Knicks have picked up a legit floor enforcer with significant experience, and I'm excited to see him rub off on the young guys on the floor. Good luck this season, Marcus. Free agent signee that I'm going to be discussing needs no introduction. But since my contract states here that I'm required to introduce him, I will. Julius Randle, a.k.a. Mr. I'll drop 45 on your head if you claim Zion is another me, but with hops. Cue the damn tape. He can pass. He's big. He's strong. I think he's got a magnetism. Okay. You think he's overrated. Oh. Just say it. You can say it. Uh, okay. I So, <sighs> Just say I it. kind of feel like he's overhyped. I feel like he's Julius Randle with hops. He's Julius Randle with <laughs> I, I, that, that, that's, that's how I believe. By the way, you're not the first person who said that. Yes. The 24-year-old former seventh overall pick by the LA Lakers in 2014 signed a three-year, $63 million contract this offseason. Well-deserved. Julius, JR, Dr. J, we need a nickname for this guy. Drop a few potential names in the comments below, please. Let's see if one sticks. All right, all right. Back to the man of the minute. Randall vastly improved his game in each of his first five seasons. No bias, but long before he became a New York Knick, Randall was one of my favorite forwards and players in the league, just to say a few. He's a prototypical big-bodied modern NBA point forward who averaged 21, 9, and 3 assists last year with the Pels. Expect him to do work on this current Knick, current Knick roster. Did I mention that he's a lefty? Pop quiz, guys. How many damn lefties on this roster? Have you ever wondered how difficult it is for a lefty to open the door? Ugh. Damn. I expect Randall to be the feature player, the go-to guy, the jack of all trades. But don't sleep on his defense either. We also caught wind of Randall working on a three ball, stretching the defense with trainer Jordan Lawley. Guys, stay tuned. We look forward to talking to Randall sometime in the near future. Best of luck, bro. Peace. Profiles, Alfred Payne. He played college basketball at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Where in 2014, he won the Lefty Drazel Award as a National College Defensive Player of the Year. Payne was then drafted with the 10th overall pick in the 2014 NBA Draft by the Philadelphia 76ers. But he was then traded to the Orlando Magic. He spent three and a half seasons in Orlando before being traded to the Phoenix Suns in February 2018. On July 9, 2018, Payne signed with the New Orleans Pelicans. In his debut for the Pelicans in their season opener on October 17, Payne recorded 10 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists. Speaking of triple doubles, Payton became the fifth player to record five consecutive triple doubles, joining Wilt Chamberlain, Michael Jordan, Oscar Robertson, and Russell Westbrook. Payton is a quick decision maker, has smart IQ, he's able to push the ball constantly driving to the basket well, and has a good eye for transition baskets. For most of his career, he's been a poor three-point shooter and has had poor health over the past three seasons. But 
In his last season in Orlando, it was his best three-point percentage, shooting at a 37% shooting clip. Payton can run an offense very well. He should develop more of a mid-range pop-up game, coming off a pick and roll, make a team pay for backing up and giving him space. Floaters should improve as well, and if he can do that, that can be a dangerous facet to his game. Mainly positives on Payton, and I look forward to how he's going to control the game for the Knicks this season. Wayne Ellington, 31 years old, 6 foot 5, 200 pound shooting guard. Let me give you a little of L's history. So Wayne played three years of college ball at North Carolina in the mid 2000s, and as a junior, led the Tar Heels to the national championship beating Michigan State. He shot seven of 10 from three point range in the final four, was named to the all tournament team, and was the NCAA basketball tournament most outstanding player. It's evident he was no punk. During his college career, however, Ellington averaged 15 points, four rebounds, and two assists. Promising young prospect, right? Ellington went 28th overall in the 2009 NBA draft, having been selected by the Minnesota Timberwolves. 10 years and nine NBA team signings later, including the Knicks, Wayne's career stat sheet reads an eight point per game average along with two rebounds and one assist, shooting 41% from the field and 38% from three. So with over 600 NBA games under his belt, he was valuable enough to start in 25% of them. Ellington's resume includes postseason appearances on three separate occasions over the last decade, averaging seven points, two rebounds, and one assist. Not bad, at least it's experience. One of his most notable performances was while on the Miami Heat. During their regular season finale last year against the Toronto Raptors, Ellington scored a career-high 32 points while setting Miami's single-season record for three-pointers as the Heat were playoff-bound ending their season sixth in the Eastern Conference. If you recall, Ellington came over to the Knicks when Tyson Chandler was traded away in 2014, only having time to grab a slice of Joe's Pizza and take a stroll around Central Park as he was immediately dumped to Sacramento having not played a single game for the Knicks. Redemption season is upon us, Ellis. But what intrigues me is that after establishing veteran NBA status, Wayne's best offensive season performance was just last season when he averaged a career-high 12 points per game for the Pistons. So this is great, right? Sure, numbers are sexy, but what does that actually mean for the Knicks? To me, Wayne's standout features include playoff experience, the ability to improve even this late in the game, his shot, and ultimately the, the determination to get buckets when needed. This guy, to me, is just simply a scorer. Obviously, he won't be starting for us, but what can we expect for a $16 million two-year run with Wayne? I mean, for this amount of money, he may be the Knicks' most impactful signing of the summer in terms of best bang for the buck. He's a good outside shooting wing, and teams need those. Think about it. We may have issues with floor spacing, especially considering our newly signed bigs, such as Julius Randle, Bobby Portis, and Taj Gibson. Along with Reggie Bullock, Ellington will potentially help spread the floor by being a threat 25 feet out. Side note, we can definitely count on Dotson for that as well. Listen, Wayne ain't no MJ, but taking all that into account, this investment has the potential to offer us the best return pound for pound. You know what that is. That's hello for New Yorkers. Welcome to Mad News, this is Jay. Let's just go right into it, baby. Chris Paul recently got traded for Russell Westbrook. It's an amazing trade that happened. What the hell with the Rockets? I'm honestly more upset I'm not gonna be watching any more State Farm commercials together with Chris Paul and James Harden. Looks kind of freaky. All right, look at his face. Look at his nose. His ears. It's got terrible eyes. Well, not so stiff. I never had a girlfriend. Okay, guys, regardless of the looks. Now, since that magic finished, why don't we go to the magical land of the Wizards? John Wall is going to be out next season for the Wizards. Tell me something that isn't new. Quick question, should the Knicks trade for John Wall? Yo, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, I can barely finish that sentence, I'm kidding. Don't worry, we're not gonna trade for him, I think. Marcus Morris is the newest Nick, right after pulling out with the Spurs. Amazing things happen when you pull out. Of a deal, and get another for more money. Good stuff firing Rich Paul too. Now, if you go to San Antonio, 
Tim Duncan is now an assistant coach for Pop and the Spurs. Congrats, Timmy. I just think it's a little bit weird how attached by the hip you and Pop are. None of my business. Multiple Knicks have mentioned that they are going to like this group. Fans are going to like this group. How the players are going to be playing together, how much of dogs everyone is, and how they're going to be like the 90s Knicks with how gritty they will be. Other news. Marvel is releasing an X-Men and Fantastic Four movie. Finally, a Fantastic Four that's going to get the reboot they deserve. The same way the Knicks reboot every year. Knicks fans, just don't hold your breath before you turn blue and really start looking like reboot. If you're a 90s baby, you know what I'm talking about. Mad news, kept it quick, kept it short. You guys continue to stick around, check out some of the other segments, and who knows what you might see the next time you see Mad News. What's up, guys? Your boy TK here, and we are back with the free agent outlook. We're going to discuss all of the pickups that we made. I brought my boy Pete. We got our guy Jay here. What's up, guys? Good to have I'm you. Man. What up, baby? What's How good? It? So let's drop it like this, right? Holla at me. How would you guys grade the Knicks offseason so far, Pete? You are hilarious. What, what are we doing? Is it like one to five? Is it like A to Z? You know, let, let's just start with what you <laughs> I'm think. giving the you whole alphabet, give, bro. Give, give me a, a letter grade. Give me a letter grade. What would you think? Honestly, C plus. Ooh, C plus. Yeah, damn oh, right. C plus. We were expecting a certain signing. Yes, I'm looking at you, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. You took less to go play with our sister brand. Mm. That's how you, you feel. I hate you, Durant. Tell us how you really feel, you. Jay. I hate's a strong word. I'm looking at you. I hate you. Do you guys, do you guys plus, know wow. they used to be the New Jersey Nets? You're aware of that, right? I mean, Kyrie probably. I mean, some guy playing. called Jason Kidd only took them to the finals twice. I mean, yeah. I think that's a lot. Yeah. Like that. Pete, what do you think? All right. As with all my answers, it always got to come with an annoying ass caveat. Ah, so yeah, right. I'm going to hit you with this. it. Here we How go. How would I grade the Knicks offseason? Yes. Based on our expectations of getting Zion Durant Kyrie or based on like what we ended up doing when what happened happened? What Two grades for me. Yes. What we ended up doing, I, honestly, I'll, I'm going to give it like a B. Such a cheat. Uh, I know. I'm going to give it a B, <laughs> B minus just because given the fact that we could not really sign any big name uh, free agents just because they didn't want to come play here. What we did in reaction to that, I think, was pretty damn smart. I got to be honest with you, because I think we picked up some pretty solid veterans that were on the market. We gave them very Knicks-friendly contracts. So at any point in time, we could ship these guys out for other players, or we could use them for a year or two to develop our young guys around. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have more options two years from now. So for me, it's like... It, I'm not happy. It was a huge disappointment considering like what we were actually trying to get. Absolutely. But given that we could get cap that, space we freed it up. was an intelligent reaction by our management, I think, to like give us a serviceable team. To okay. be honest, I don't even think it was so much reaction because I think ever since even a little bit after All Star break, our management was already planning Plan B. Uh, planning plan B. So and guys, they had Plan B and C. Let me just say this. Yeah. There's there's almost absolutely no point to having me on this segment. I mean, you guys kind of covered pretty much damn near how the fan base feels. Uh, All right, so guys. Speak. So just tune in. Plus, comment below. 245. <laughs> I am going to hit them with a B. I'm going to give the Knicks grade a B because when it boils down to it, I ask myself a few questions. Did the Knicks get better this offseason? Are we a better team than where we left off last year? Absolutely. I agree. 100%. Right? Did yeah. we get yeah. more shooting? We absolutely did. And Bullock, yeah. when he's healthy, Ellington, Portis can spread the floor. Randall can spread the floor. Am I missing anybody? No, I don't think I am. Did we get better rebounding? Absolutely. Better defensively? Yes. So in the grand scheme of things, were we a little bit disappointed on, on where we were led to believe? Yes, but who led us there? The media, the yeah. fans. Our our management never said, "Hey, expect the big guy. I, expect this guy." I to have come. to say this though. It's one of those uh, things where, honestly, we were at the bottom. You can only go up from here. Right. So okay. damn near almost anyone we would have picked up would have been an improvement with the amount of cap space that we had, and you have to spend a certain amount of that cap space. You're right now, but I think we, spend we it did. Wisely especially with some of the players like Julius Randle. Okay, You're taking someone that is still incredibly young, still has their complete whole future in front of them, and you give them three years, 63 million. That third year, correct me if I'm wrong, that's an option. 
The third year is an option, so you actually have him for two guaranteed years. You're talking about a guy that's doing 20 and 10. Yeah. Easy. And and you could only go up from here. Pete, let me just ask you this. Hold on. He did 20 and 10 sharing the court with AD. With AD. For a good portion of the year. And Alfred Payne, who we have on our team as well. Pete, let me ask you this, right? Now, based on your grade, are you disappointed with... Hold on, let me ask Pete here. Were you it's disappointed a with the outcome of the Knicks offseason? And if so, could you take a step back, remove your emotions, mm-hmm. and realize, okay, they did do the right thing in retrospect? Pete doesn't have analytics. I'll Talking about emotion. <laughs> I don't process emotion. Uh, no, I, I'm going to say, like, for me, the I've, I've been distracted all summer long, not by the types of players we picked up. Summer dresses. But I think... Like the, the way the free agency played out, to me the most disappointing aspect of it was is we got a sort of deeper look into or a deeper understanding as to how I think the the NBA and just like the public at large mm-hmm. actually views the Knicks. I think to some degree we, we as fans we do live in a bit of a bubble and a lot of that is out of love because yeah. we just want to support our team so much. But a lot of it is just cause we're you know, we're they're on the outside looking in, yeah. but we're in, in our own little space. So to me, it was disappointing to kind of to kind of see these players choose choose the Brooklyn Nets mm-hmm. and choose our team. It kind of showed me a little bit about what where we actually are in the totem pole of the yeah. NBA. So that was disappointing. But as far as the players we picked up, if the plan is to build our young guys, I think we picked up a, a bunch of really great professionals. This should have been plan A, honestly. I guess, but I think these guys that we picked up are actually going to work with the young core and root for them. And I think our young core is just so likable right now that having vets around them was the right move to I help agree. develop them. And I think the chem- I think there's actually going to be, since we've kind of started mm-hmm. doing this show, I think this team is probably going to have the best chemistry I would hope so, yeah. we've seen uh, of the team so far. And I'm including that super team that we were supposed to have. That was a super team. <laughs> you yeah. know, us and the Warriors. Yo, D-Rose, where you team. at? <laughs> you know, that, that team. So, so that, like, like I said, that was the most disappointing part of it. Like, what it revealed about Knicks, the Knicks and their standing in the NBA. But as far as the players we got, I think these are consummate professionals. Like, for me, Marcus Morris was an exci- exciting pickup. Yeah. Like, I was actually yeah. excited to get him. Yep. Julius yeah. Randle, these guys can actually grow with the team. It's not like they're old too Mm -hmm. these are like slightly older guys that can actually grow with 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 our young core so i'm excited from the perspective of developing our young core and not so much what maybe these guys can give us on a night to night basis awesome jay i'm not going to ask you the same question because Mm -hmm. i think i speak for all of us here as well as all of us on the show yes that we are we were a little disappointed with the outcome for, for obvious reasons but i think we all understand the bigger picture here and uh, I think we're all fans of the moves made. But, Jay, I am going to ask you this question. Talk to me, baby. Mm. Do you see our young guys meshing with the vets? It depends. And I honestly feel like it's a little bit loaded. You had people uh, like Coach Fisdale calling like out fries. some of the players for saying, yo, you're not focused. Oof. You are Fortnite. playing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're playing video games, and you're talking about somebody like Bobby Portis that's out here snuffing people in practice. So His I'm teammates. just saying. I'm just saying. There's the possibility that they may not mesh well just due to some immaturity in the maturity of other players. Some of these bets. Mm-hmm. Now, I do think we may have overpaid in some instances to get some of these players. And as well, Fisdale has his work completely cut out for him. I think this I upcoming agree. season, I there. Agree. I don't think 48 minutes is enough minutes in a game to go around for the amount of players we have. You're Not talking about, exactly, yeah. you're talking about at least an 11-man rotation. That's insane, damn near, in the NBA right now, the landscape right now. Let, let me just... I just want to respond ahead. to Jay real quick. I totally understand your concern, and as you were talking about it, I kind of started thinking about, you know, that is possible. A lot of these guys are on short contracts, so you kind of hope that they don't, like, play for the numbers to get good contracts. When Absolutely. You want to play for the team. But at the same time, I think considering what team they've come to, I think there's an understanding and expectation that this is a, a team in development. They're not, yeah, no, no one's going to come here and try to be like the main guy because either way, the Knicks are kind of at the bottom of the barrel. and they gotta That's what Julius up. Randle came in here for. He, he came to this guy, city to be the main guy, to catapult himself look, and be an all-star in this league. In the East, you can do it, young but man. But you can't play in the modern NBA and not understand that the team game is paramount. So yeah, if he nice. wants to be the guy in today's NBA, that means kind of playing within a system. So 
I'm going to be judging him based on that. If he's selfish and wants to just pad his stats to get a nice contract, that's going to tell me a lot about his character. But something tells me that these guys are coming in. No one's got any expectations other than, like, let's just not be an embarrassment. And I think that's actually a good starting point. I, I agree. So. so I think we all have our reservations about this team and how they can gel. But one thing is is, is consensus across the board. Mm -hmm. They The guys that we all brought in, mm -hmm. they were all consummate pros. Yes. We hear Bobby Portis is a dog. Randall's a dog. Yep. Peyton is one of the hardest working guys on the team. Morris, you know, Wayne is a dog. Ellington, Morris. I mean, you know, it, the list goes on. So I I've think heard we brought this in before. the right. But, I, but listen. I've heard this before. Oh, we're going to be the right? mix of the 90s. It's the same thing of, I don't usually do that. We'll, we'll, we'll see. So it's that, my first that time. That leads into my next question. It's the role of pessimistic Pete over here tonight. <laughs> I like it. The Knicks of the 90s. I love it. That team that we like so very much made the, the playoffs year after year. They were that a perennial made, playoff made. team. Really quickly, guys. Yeah. Do you see this team as a playoff team? Do you see this team as a playoff team? I think team? we're going to sneak into the playoffs. Oof. I am blend I'm saying that we actually will find that chemistry. Fizdale is going to figure it out. All of our players are going to figure it Love out. It. I also do believe one of the best pickups and low-key pickups, honestly, is going to be Alfred Payne. Payne. If he can yep. stay healthy, yes. Mark this is word. a gentleman that can actually run the offense. This is no offense to Frank. This is no offense to Dennis Smith Jr. I just think they have two different approaches to the game. Yes. Yep. You take someone like Alfred, I mean, five straight triple doubles. You're talking about exclusive company yep. that he had towards the end of the Pelican season. Welcome to New York. Pete, what do you think? Bro, I'm with you, and when we talk about our starting lineups later, I'm going to talk a little bit about, like, uh, my, why it was a tough choice, the DSJ Alpha Payton pick. But I say uh, this year we could be... This year we could be last year's Orlando Magic. Um, and by that I mean that we'll be just okay. talented enough to sneak into that eighth mm -hmm. spot and maybe make some noise. But to me, like, that's why I like having veterans, and that's why I'm not against playing these veterans, because I think... Even if that means costing some of our young guys minutes, if we get into the playoffs, that alone, I think, would be a huge experience for these guys. And just that exposure to teams playing at that level would be, to me, more valuable than just trying to get our young guys minutes this year to have another this is playoff the list. Yeah. This is so the I think so. Guys, I say possibly a seed. There's a chance. The guys, I, I must. You know, we can talk Knicks. All day with you guys. We love this. We love you guys. But uh, my producer over there is giving me the word. I got to wrap it up. Giving so us I'm going to end you with this. <laughs> Signing off. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. I'm just That's kidding, it. guys. Please <laughs> like, subscribe, comment below. Let us know what you think about the uh, free agent outlook yeah. and how you felt about this current all season. Put your emotions to the side, guys. Come on. We're, we're beyond this. There's no Zion, no KD, no Kyrie. We got the mad good Nick Who show needs here, baby. Or you can just tell me how you really feel. is the starting lineup going to look like in 2019 so that's what we're here to break down each of us got one minute on the clock we'll give you our starting five and then we'll take some time to justify it let us know in the comments what you guys think so here we go with mine let's put a minute on the clock at starting point guard i got dennis smith jr at uh at shooting guard rj barrett then I got Morris, Randall, and Mitch. I think that one, Morris in particular, that one's going to be a fun one to watch because Kevin Knox, I mean, a lot of people are slotting him at the small forward. I'm not buying it yet. We wouldn't sign a guy like Morris who really wants to be that go-to scoring option at small forward unless we were actually going to put him there. So Kevin Knox can sit on the bench for a little bit. I think R.J. Barrett, almost a given at shooting guard unless Damian Dotson, of course, challenges him there. Alfred Payton's also on the roster. Uh, if Dennis Smith doesn't watch out, I think he's got a small shot at taking over the starting point guard role, but Dennis Smith Jr. does have a lot to prove. I think Randall and Mitchell Robinson at the four and five are pretty much locked the fuck up. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. On to the next one. Alfred Payton is a more natural playmaker, averaging eight assists a game. DSJ is more of an athletic score first point guard. I was torn, but I'm going to give it to DSJ just because he's the young guy, and I think he deserves some time to prove himself. Shooting guard, got to go with RJ Barrett. I think he could be the best offensive player on our team. And uh, he's a young guy. He's a third pick, so he deserves that starting spot and get his minutes. 
Uh, small forward, I'm going to give it to Marcus Morris just because I think Kevin Knox still quite hasn't earned it. But at the same time, Marcus Morris is a seasoned vet looking to make an impact. And I think uh, we would do well having him in the starting lineup, uh, getting us as many wins as possible. Number four, Julius Randle. He's our most talented power forward. That's kind of a no-brainer. And at number five, you've got to go with Mitch Robinson. He's kind of the future of our team. I see him as probably our primary scoring option, especially at the start of games. So you've got to have him in there. And that rounds out my starting lineup. Yo, what up, guys? So I'm going to give you my starting lineup for this season. So there's two ways I can look at it. There's the corporate starting lineup and what I actually want. In terms of what I actually want, I will go with my man DSJ, RJ Barrett at the two, Marcus Morris at the three, Julius Randle at the four, and Mitch at the five. What I think is going to happen from an actual corporate standpoint, I think it's going to be DSJ at the one, although Alfred Payton will be out for that job, especially being the playmaker and the additional shooters we added on the team. Number two, RJ Barrett, no brainer, third pick. He's got it. For number three, I'm gonna have to go with my man Kevin Knox just because I wanna continue the Knicks vision, thinking that we are building our young core. At number four, Julius Randle, that's a no brainer, a 20 and 10 machine, a 2.0 Ennis Canner. And lastly, my man Mitch Robinson, the only center on the team that could put those blocks up. Let's go for that Patrick Ewing average, baby. Starting lineups. DSJ is going to be running the one. Hopefully, his shot has improved. We all know he's been working on his shot mechanics. I better see something from you this coming season. At the two, RJ Barrett. Can you just please, like, keep the turbo button on? You look really slow at times during the Summer League. I have to say, you were the only player in Summer League to do very well. But keep that turbo on. You need to go a little bit faster. Kevin Knox, I see you starting at the three. Even though we just signed Marcus Morris, I see him getting suspended for snuffing somebody during the season. Talk about New York grit. Julius Randle at the four. Yes, he's gonna be 20 and 10. I could potentially see him upping those numbers up to roughly 24 and 11. And then Mitch at the five. I think it's gonna be Log City happening here in New York City. That's my starting five. Guys, TK here. Let's talk lineups. At least line of predictions, at least. DSJ, I had as my starting point guard. But, uh, you know, I'm not too sure if that's going to last. We have Alfred Payton, and uh, I think he's going to light a fire under DSJ. So I expect a lot of great things from him. He's been working on his jump shot. He's kind of rebuilt it from the ground up. We shall see. RJ Barrett has got to be a lock at the two. We already know the type of potential that this kid has. Kevin Knox is going to be our starting three. I think he's earned it. You know, I, I like the additions that we brought in, including Marcus Morris, even Iggy Brazdakis. Far, you got to get that right. Brazdakis. I like that. But Julius Randle, clear, clear cut above everybody else we have at the forward position, uh, is definitely going to start. Mitchell Robinson, our guy, my guy, Money Mitch, number 23 this season, is going to lead the league in blocks. I'm sorry, guys. Are we making predictions along with the lineups? My man Mitch is going to lead the league in blocks. That's my five. What do you guys think? Comment below. Give me a sixth man. That was my five. Comment below. <laughs> I'm just playing. Uh, six man, let's let's go up the top. Let's Built for this. Alonzo Trier. I'll let your boy. I'm out of here. Shred my contract. <laughs> I'm done. I quit. What's up, y'all? It's Nate Robinson. Y'all watching the Mad Good Nick Show. Peace.